Hey guys, welcome back for another exciting edition of Dr. Mortensen talking to himself. All right, <clears throat> so today's quote, you know, I usually have a quote on the first slide up here and some of these I pick and some are chosen by other uh, professors. But this one I really like. And this is the way the world ends, not with a bang, but a whimper. This is a quote by T.S. Eliot. Now, this one's not a spiritual quote. Usually, they're spiritual quotes, but uh, I'll explain why this is the quote for today. Before we get into that, though, I wanted to um, clear some things up because a few of you are still confused about how we're going to be doing exams going forward. So, as a um, group of faculty teaching CHEM 105, We've decided actually to not have a fourth exam, and instead we're only going to have the final. So we're going to have the final. It'll run through finals week, uh, through the normal times. It'll be administered either through Learning Suite or through Proctorial. Uh, we'll have to let you know as that gets a little closer. And I'll have information about how many questions are gonna be on the exam but the general format is it's gonna be all multiple choice since it's all gonna be on Learning Suite. And uh, a fourth of the exam is going to cover this final material we're covering since the last exam. And then uh, the rest of the exam will cover previous material. So a quarter of it will be on the material from exam one, a quarter will be on the material from exam two, a quarter from the material on exam three, and then the last quarter will be on this last step we've covered since exam three. It would have normally been covered on exam four. Uh, if you have questions about that, reach out and I will have more details as we get closer. Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about really quickly is the option to go pass fail on your grade. So this can be a really attractive option for people, especially that are getting C's. Uh, or that range of grade um, because it won't lower your GPA as much. But the thing that you should consider when thinking about going pass fail is that many of you are going on to medical school or dental school or others, some other health profession or um, some other higher degree after your bachelor's. And some of these programs require you to have a letter grade in chemistry. So I'd be really careful to make sure that any potential schools you're interested in going to, that you either look at their website and find their requirements or you reach out to them and ask what would be acceptable uh, in that circumstance. Um, so if you're gonna go the pass-fail route, that can be a good option for a lot of you, but just make sure it's the best option and not one that's going to hurt you down the road. All right, with that all being said, Today, we're going to be discussing entropy. Uh, so entropy is a very interesting subject, and this will be covering chapter 12.1 through 12.3 in the reading. But before we get into what act our entropy actually is, we're going to review the first law of thermodynamics here. You'll remember that the first law of thermodynamics is that the amount of energy in the universe is constant. So energy can't be created or destroyed, or the change in energy of the universe is zero. And we can move energy from place to place by work or heat, and uh, we can change the form the energy appears in. But these two laws together don't tell us why energy changes occur in the first place. So why will energy move from one place to another, or why will a reaction occur? To figure that out, we're gonna start by introducing a term that you probably think you understand the definition of, spontaneity. So often, we associate spontaneity with random actions, but spontaneity is actually a little something different. So something that's spontaneous is a process that once it's started continues to occur with outside or without outside intervention. So for example, uh, if you throw a lit match onto a pile of other lit matches, these will burn and they will continue to burn until all of the 
wood is consumed and all the uh, fuel on the tip of the match is consumed. So this is what we'd call a spontaneous process. Whereas baking a cake, this is also a chemical reaction where you mix ingredients and you throw them in the oven and you add heat from your oven. But let's say you heat this halfway and then pull the cake out. It's not gonna keep baking. You have to leave it in and get all that energy from the oven to finish cake bake, or cake baking. So how can we predict then if a chemical reaction is gonna be spontaneous or not? Obviously the match example and the baking example are things we have experience with, but other things like predicting when ice is going to melt or any solid really is going to melt, how do we know when that's going to occur by itself or not? Um, so this transfer of heat or enthalpy that we see a lot isn't actually enough by itself to predict whether a reaction is going to be spontaneous or not. We need one other thing that we need to consider, and that other thing is called entropy. So entropy, rigorously defined, is the dispersion of energy at a specific temperature. So how energy is arranged or dispersed before and after a process is more important than which direction energy is flowing. So a reaction can be exothermic or endothermic and still be spontaneous or not spontaneous, but it matters more how the energy is arranged before and after the reaction. That's gonna help us figure out if it's spontaneous or not. Now, how do we disperse energy in a system? There's a few different ways and you these won't be brand new ideas to you, but we're gonna discuss them in a new way today. The first is the configuration of everything in your system. So what I'm showing you here is a, or an example of positional entropy. So we have a container with one sphere or one side full of gas, and then the other side is empty. We have a little nozzle right here that we can turn to open and let the gas flow through. And so we have two different arrangements here. We have one arrangement where everything's on one side and one where it's all spread out. So the way you spread out your atoms or molecules is one way you disperse energy. The other way is through kinetic energy. So how these guys are vibrating, how they're rotating, how they're translating through space, bouncing around. These are all different ways of dispersing energy. So dispersing kinetic energy and dispersing potential energy. And processes that result in greater dispersion of energy are spontaneous. So this leads us into the second law of thermodynamics. And that is that the entropy of the universe always increases with any spontaneous process. And really, the entropy of the universe increases with any process, but specifically the entropy of a system will increase uh, the, or the entropy of the universe if it's spontaneous. So the delta S of our system we're studying plus the delta S of our surroundings, so the change in enthalpy or entropy in our beaker, and the change in entropy of everything else always increases. So I won't read the original uh, statement of this law because it is in German. I don't read German well or at all, but translated into English, it's that the entropy of the world tends to a maximum. So why is a greater dispersion of energy favored over a lower dispersion of energy? It's because a greater dispersion of energy has a higher probability of occurring. Now to explain what that means and to explain how we disperse energy, um, we're mostly going to be talking about potential energy in this uh, discussion because it's a lot simpler to talk about and than the kinetic energy. And we'll start by just talking about this example where we have four molecules. We have four molecules in a container with a left side and a right side. We're gonna talk about uh, just three arrangements of this. 
These are the three possible arrangements where you have all four of the molecules on one side, you have three of the molecules on one side and one on the other, or where you have two molecules on the left and two molecules on the right. So in this first setup, there's only one way of doing this. You have molecule one, molecule two, molecule three, and molecule four all on one side, and you have zero on the other. So there's one way to get arrangement one. With arrangement two, there's actually four different ways you can do this. If we say that each of these molecules is a different unique molecule, then we could have molecule one, two, and three on the left, and molecule four on the right. We could have molecule one, two, and four on the left. We could have one, three, and four on the left, or two, three, and four on the left, with the remaining molecule on the right. And then if we're gonna look at arrangement three, we actually have six different ways to get arrangement three. You could have molecules one and two, one and two on the left, and three and four on the right. We could have one and three on the left and two and four on the right. We could have uh, one and four on the left and two and the three on the right. Might have said that one twice, I don't know. We could have two and three on the left. We could have two and four on the left. We could have three and four on the left. So there's one way to get arrangement one, four ways to get arrangement two, and six ways to get arrangement uh, three. So in total, there's 11 different ways of arranging these, and six of those 11 ways result in having two molecules on either side. So arrangement three is our most probable arrangement, and it has everything dispersed the most. Now, these different ways of arranging things are what we call microstates. When we denote a microstate or the number of microstates with a W. So a microstate is a unique arrangement of the position and momenta of the particles in a system. So what I have here in this table, this is the same general idea we were looking at on the previous slide, except in this setup, each individual molecule is denoted with a different color. So on the left here, we have arrangement one where all four are on the left, arrangement two where three are on the left and one is on the right, arrangement three where we have two on the left and on the right, et cetera, et cetera. And what we're looking at here are gas molecules, right, that can bounce from one side to the other. But let's say we take this arrangement right here where we have two yellows, or we have the yellow and the blue on the left and purple and the red on the right. Let's say we drop this temperature so these guys all freeze down to the bottom. Now, if these are frozen, they're not able to bounce back and forth. And so we'd be stuck in only one microstate and we wouldn't have any other accessible microstates. So accessible microstates are microstates that we can reach at a certain temperature. And this number of microstates is going to depend heavily on temperature, on pressure, on phase, on a bunch of things. Right? It's going to, the temperature is going to affect dipole-dipole interactions, Van der Waals interactions, etc. So there's a lot that's actually going on in these. We're not going to make you calculate total entropies of systems um, from molecular views. We are gonna make you calculate that from other stuff. But for right now, just understand that microstates are the different ways of arranging things. And the more microstates you have, the more entropy you have. All right, so let's look at our three different arrangements now, but let's pretend now instead of four atoms, we're gonna start with 100. So uh, if we have 100 atoms, there's only one way to get 100 atoms on one side of this. But if we were going to put 75% of the atoms on one side and 25 on the other, then there would actually be two times 10 to the 23rd ways we could do that. Where we'd have you know, one through 75 molecules over here and 76 through 100 over here or one through 74 and 76, and then 74 and 77 through 100 on the right. Right, so there'd be two times 10 to the 23rd different ways of arranging the molecules to still get a 75 to 25 ratio on the two different sides. And as for getting 
50% uh, of the molecules are atoms on one side and 50% on the other, there's actually one times 10 to the 29th ways of doing that. So there's about a million times more ways to get a 50-50 dispersion of the gas than there is to get a 75-25 dispersion of the gas. Which means it's a million times more likely that the gas is gonna be spread out evenly than distributed heavily on one side or the other. And notice too, that this is only with 100 atoms. And so the arrangement, again, with the highest probability is arrangement three. But now let's ramp that up, take it from 100 atoms to a few more. So what I'm gonna show here are some numbers that might be a little confusing, so I'll try and explain them the best I can. But basically, we're gonna compare the probability of having 50% of the atoms on the left and 50 on the right to 75 on the left and 25% on the right. So we're gonna be comparing the probability of arrangement three to arrangement two with different numbers of atoms. So if we had four atoms, like we saw here, the probability of having arrangement three to arrangement two would be about 1.5. So that means we'd have 1.5 times more, or we'd be 1.5 times more likely to be in arrangement three than arrangement two. Now let's go up to 100 atoms. And this is the data we just looked at on the previous slide. Where now it's 10 to the sixth or a million times more likely to have this arrangement three where 50% is on either side than to have arrangement two where you have 75% on one side and 25% on, on the other. Now let's add another zero onto this get us to a thousand atoms. And now it's 10 to the 57th times more likely to have an even distribution of your atoms than to have a bunch on one side and a few on the other. We add another zero on this. Now it's 10 to the 568 times more likely to have an even distribution than to have most of the atoms on one side versus the other. Right, so that is a one with 568 zeros after it. I don't even know a name for that number. But now let's get into the scale we generally work with. Let's say we have a whole mole of atoms. What is the likelihood of having arrangement three over arrangement two? It's roughly equal to 10, time, or 10 to the Avogadro's number. So that's 10 to six times 10 to the 23rd zeros which is a really big number, it comes out to, uh, and of course this is just an approximation, but it's really close to 10 to the Avogadro's number of possibilities. And so the likelihood, I think somebody at the beginning of the semester asked if there's some probability of all the gas in a room moving from one side to the other, and there is some probability of it, but the probability is so low that it's essentially zero. So the probability of the gas being completely dispersed is the highest. And the most probable arrangement is the most likely to occur and has the highest entropy. So let's give ourselves a practical example of why entropy or this idea of dispersion is important. And in this case, we are actually going to talk about kinetic energy. Let's say we have two objects. Let's say we have a box with hot gas and a box with cold gas, and we're gonna put them together, let them interact. The energy is gonna disperse uh, between these two objects. And we know that when two objects at different temperatures are brought into contact, energy will flow from the higher temperature object to the lower temperature object. Why? Well, we know that the temperature is related to the kinetic energy of these molecules in here. So in the low temperature box, we'd have gas molecules moving around real slow. In the high temperature box, they'd be moving around really fast. But that still doesn't explain why the energy would move from the high temperature guy to the low temperature. And to understand this, we need to look at microstates and what's going on uh, with microstates. Okay, let's pretend that each atom has only two available energy levels. They can have an energy of zero or an energy of one. 
So here on the left, oh, I think I actually switched these boxes. So now the thing on the left is colder and the thing on the right is hotter. Each of these circles denotes a different atom or molecule, a unique atom or molecule. And so here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight atoms at zero energy and two at energy of one. And then in our hot box, we have the same total number of atoms, but here we have one, two, three, four atoms at a higher temperature. Now, if these are all unique, we can arrange these differently so that this could be molecule one. So molecule one could be at zero energy or at one energy, et cetera, as long as the total energy of our system equals out to four. So in this uh, environment, we would have 210 different ways of arranging all of our molecules. And in this environment where we have a total energy of two, we would only have 45 different ways of arranging everything. So in the cold box, we have 45 microstates. In the warm box, we have 210. Now added together, so let's say we let these gases mix together now, then we'd have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 cold atoms and six warm atoms. Then our total number of microstates actually becomes 9,450. And just so you're aware, this is a really easy number to calculate because it's just this number of microstates times this number of microstates. But anyways, the energy is going to flow in the direction that leads the most probable distribution, or another way of saying that is it's going to flow in the direction that's going to give us the most number of microstates. So let's look at the least probable situation where all of the heat flows from the cold box into the hot box. Okay, so in this case, everything in the cold box now has uh, an energy of zero. And since everything has an energy of zero, there's only one way of arranging everything. So molecule one, two, three, four, five, et cetera, are all going to have an energy of zero. So you're gonna have one microstate in the left box. Now in the right box, we're now, we now have six hot atoms and four cold atoms. And that's just the opposite of what we saw uh, before everything, or before energy was moved. And so the number of microstates is still actually 210. But now if we take 210 and multiply it by one, then we only have 210 total microstates when these two guys are brought into contact. You compare that to the original scenario where we had 9,000 uh, microstates, and you really quickly see that this is not a probable outcome. So let's look at it now where energy is equally distributed between the two boxes. So the hot box gave one energy unit to the cold box. Now we have three hot atoms in each box and seven cold atoms. Well, in each of these boxes, there's 120 different ways of arranging the molecules. So the number of microstates for this box went down. The number of microstates for this box went up from 45 to 120. But the total number of microstates here, when we multiply 120 by 120, is actually a little over 14,000. And so now we have more total microstates than in our beginning situation. Now, this is dealing with only 20 atoms, of course. Um, and so these numbers of microstates don't seem quite so dramatic. So looking at this, you'd say, okay, the probability of this thing happening is really low, but it still could happen. But when we go up to larger numbers of atoms and molecules, these distributions look much more dramatic. Uh, to the point where this scenario of the heat flowing from the cold box to the hot box becomes essentially zero. And this scenario where the heat equally di distributes between one side and the other becomes so dramatically more probable that it becomes the only really probable scenario. And these distributions of the number of microstates are what we call Boltzmann distributions.
It's the number of microstates that tells you uh, which scenario is more probable, and it tells you a Boltzmann distribution tells you the probability of a, a specific scenario occurring. So let's talk about Boltzmann for a second. This is Ludwig Boltzmann. His story is kind of sad. So he was a really good scientist. He came up with an equation here relating entropy to the number of microstates. So in chemistry, we describe entropy as being equal to a constant called Boltzmann's constant times the natural log of the number of microstates at a given temperature. The reason for Boltzmann's constant here is we have to relate the number of microstates to the enthalpy, and I will show you how to do that in Wednesday's lecture. Um, but the entropy increases then as the number of microstates increases. The number of microstates generally increases as the temperature increases. Um, but the number of ways of distributing the energy increases, uh, or as that increases, the entropy increases. And this term for S is what we call the absolute entropy. <coughs> now my throat's getting a little dry. Now, the reason uh, Boltzmann's story is a little sad is because this derivation requires you to believe in atoms. So the number of microstates kind of depends on your ability to think of putting atoms in different places and giving them different energies and so forth. But at uh, Ludwig Boltzmann's time, the idea of atoms was still a little uh, debatable and he ended up killing himself in his office, uh, partially out of frustration with the state of science and the ignorance of scientists at the time. Um, but he had his equation, his famous equation, carved onto his tombstone. And so he's known now as the man who believed in atoms. And if you go to his tombstone, you can see his equation carved in stone there. So he was really into this science, really passionate about it. I personally would never kill myself over science uh, because there's just better things in life. You know, the things that science has made possible, like ice cream cones. All right, let's consider now the factors that influence entropy. So let's say we're looking at a system, uh, a beaker of one uh, chemical versus a beaker full of another, which is going to have more entropy how are we going to be able to figure that out? So some of the factors that influence entropy are mass. So uh, what I have listed over here are various uh, chemicals and their entropy. And I list their entropy in joules per moles Kelvin. Um, and so as you can see, as these guys get heavier, their entropy increases. Another thing that influences entropy is molecular structure or shape. So what I have here is octane, which is C8H10, and isooctane, which is also C8H10, but these are constitutional isomers of one another. And isooctane has more branching here. And what you'll see is the entropy of isooctane is only 328 joules per mole Kelvin, whereas the entropy for octane is 361 joules per mole Kelvin. So the species with less branching, or the isomer with less branching, has higher entropy than the species with more branching. And the reason for that is this guy with less branching now can snake and wiggle into different conformers, whereas isooctane, uh, it has some freedom to change its conformation, particularly around this central carbon here. This group over here can rotate to the bottom and be somewhat of a trains to this other group or it can be cis to it, but the octane has much more flexibility and therefore has higher entropy. And the last thing that uh, affects this is rigidity. So things that are more flexible uh, with lower rigidity have higher entropy, they can move more. Um, and this 
also goes along with solids, liquids, gases. A solid is going to have less entropy than the liquid because the liquid can move more. All right, let's see how you're dealing with this stuff with an iClicker quiz. So what I have here are three questions actually, and for each of them, or for each of the, these pairs, which is likely to have the highest entropy, or entropy if both are at the same temperature. I really wish they'd made entropy and entropy significantly different words, but they didn't. So we're stuck with this. But if you'd like to pause the video now and work through this uh, on your own, you can. All right, so this first pair, we have hydrochloric acid as a gas and hydrochloric acid as a liquid. Running into a room with hydrochloric acid gas is gonna really hurt your eyes and your throat. But which of these has more entropy? Well, a gas is going to be much more able to move and adopt different microstates than a liquid. And so the hydrochloric acid gas is going to have a higher entropy than the liquid. All right, now we have methanol and ethanol. Uh, these are both liquids. Ethanol has two carbons, methanol only has one. And of course they both have an OH group and some other hydrogens. But ethanol is higher in mass and so it is going to have higher entropy. It also has a little more wiggle to it. And then finally, which has higher entropy pentane or 2,2-dimethylpropane? I forgot to put the physical state of the 2,2-dimethylpropane, but let's pretend these are both liquids. The formula for both of these is C5H12, but pentane is a five carbon chain whereas 2,2-dimethylpropane is a three carbon chain with two carbons sticking out in the middle. And in this case, our pentane is gonna have higher entropy because it has less branching, it has more ability to wiggle than the 2,2-dimethylpropane. All right, now let's talk about factors that affect a change in our entropy. So this will be our sign of our change in entropy as we get into that. So what I'm gonna highlight now are three different species. So we've got bromine, water, and butane. For each of these, I've highlighted the gas and liquid states of these species. And what you'll notice is that in each case, the gas is going to have a higher entropy than the liquid state. So the number of independent moving particles or the ability of the particles to move around is going to result in an increased entropy. Uh, and this also includes, uh, let's say you have bromine gas at 100 degrees Kelvin versus 110 degrees Kelvin. The hotter guy is gonna have more of its intermolecular interactions overcome. And so the gas is gonna be more free to move around and bounce around. And so the more you can overcome intermolecular interactions, the higher your entropy is going to be. Also, if you increase your volume, you're also going to increase the number of places your atoms or molecules can go to, and that's going to result in increased entropy. And generally, almost always, as you increase the temperature, you're increasing the kinetic energy and increasing the entropy of your system. I believe I know of one case where that's not true, but I'm not. I'm not confident enough in that case to say it without having looked it up. All right, so basically though, the number of microstates you have, as that increases, that is going to increase the entropy of your system. All right, so let's have another eye clicker practice here. I have four different processes, and for each of them, I want you to predict whether an increase or a decrease in entropy occurs when each of these processes occur. For each of these, we're going to pretend that the temperature doesn't change. All right, so this first one, if you'd like to pause the video now, you can. So this first one, we have liquid water going to gaseous water. 
So this would be happening at 100 degrees Celsius if we were all in San Diego right now, enjoying the beach, or well, no, don't enjoy the beach because it's closed. But let's say we're boiling some water, which has higher entropy, the liquid or the gas, or is going from a liquid to a gas, increasing or decreasing the entropy. Well, a gas is going to have more ability to move around than a liquid, so it's going to be increasing our entropy. Now here, let's say we have NH3 plus HNO3 going to HNO, or NH4, NO3. This is two separate molecules reacting and combining to form one single molecule. And so we're reducing the number of molecules. So this is going to result in a decrease in entropy. Uh, now, we could also look at this and say that these are two gases going to a solid. And so we have a phase change resulting in a decrease in entropy there as well. Uh, and so then the question becomes, which is more important? So let's say we had two liquids reacting here going to be a gas with one molecule, which would be more important, the phase change or the change in the number of molecules, and the answer to that is it's going to actually be a case-by-case -case basis where we'd have to look at the entropy of everything involved. Um, okay, so let's look at this next question. So this is the empirical formula, or I'm sorry, no, it's not, it's the molecular formula. Oh, it is also the empirical formula for sucrose, which is sugar. Let's say we take some sucrose and we put that in water and it dissolves. So this is a phase change from a solid state to an aqueous state. Is this going to result in more or less entropy? Well, the sugar is now free to move around the casting. And so now the entropy has increased in that system. Finally, let's go from solid graphite to solid diamond. In both of these cases, we are sticking with the same phase. But the difference is with the graphite, we're going to have independent sheets and we're gonna to have to combine those all into one big molecule of diamond. So we're going from more molecules to less molecules. We're decreasing the number of independent particles. And so we are decreasing the entropy of our system. Of course, if you have questions about that, let me or a TA know. I will try and help you out. Some of you email me um, a lot. Some of you don't email me very much. Hopefully everyone is emailing me as much as they need to and you're not feeling shy or awkward about it. But who knows? Everyone feels shy or awkward from time to time. All right, let's look at a diamond now. Let's say we have a perfect diamond. So there's no boron or silicone or nitrogen or phosphorus or any metals in there. Most of the time diamonds have all that other stuff in their crystal. But let's say that this is just a perfect crystal lattice of carbon, it's all just diamond. And let's say we have it at zero degrees Kelvin. Well, what is our entropy of this system? Well, everything is in a crystal lattice. It can't go anywhere else. So positionally, everything has one uh, place to go. So the number of microstates resulting from changing positions is one. You have one microstate because you can't arrange anything any differently. And then uh, let's look at our kinetic entropy. How can we distribute the energy throughout this crystal? Well, there's only one way of distributing all that energy, which is almost not present. There is actually a little bit of vibration still going on in this diamond, but Everything is at a minimum of energy. They can't give up any energy to anybody else. And so there's only one microstate uh, resulting from the kinetic entropy. So you combine those together, you multiply the positional entropy times the kinetic energy and you get one microstate. And so our entropy is equal to our Boltzmann constant times the natural log of our number of microstates. And the natural log of anything, just so you know, is Sorry, the natural log of one is always zero. And so our entropy of this crystal is zero. 
And that actually is our third law of thermodynamics, that the entropy of a perfect crystal is zero and absolute zero. Right? Now this is nice because it provides a zero point for our entropy. And it also lets us know that we can actually measure entropy directly. We don't have to just measure the change in entropy like we have to do with enthalpy. Uh, we can measure it absolutely. Now, the way we actually do that is we start with our species at zero degrees Kelvin. And what we actually do is we measure the heat capacity of this species as we increase the temperature. And we measure it up until we get to about 298 degrees Kelvin. And so we have this term that you're gonna use called the standard molar entropy. And that's the absolute entropy of one mole of a substance in its standard state at 298 Kelvin and one bar or about one atmosphere of pressure. The way you calculate this is you take your species at zero degrees Kelvin and you heat it up so you add temp or add energy at a known rate and you measure the heat capacity of that species. And the heat capacity actually relates directly to the number of microstates in your system. You don't have to understand why that is right now. Um, but something else I'll tell you about the heat capacity is I presented it to you as a constant. So I gave you a constant value for the heat capacity of uh, ice and a constant value for the heat capacity of water. And that's actually a lie. The heat capacity changes uh, with temperature. But that working with that kind of heat capacity is pretty complicated. And you don't have to worry about that at this point. But the way they do this, the way they measure this, they start really low and they crank up the temperature. And as they do, they measure this heat capacity. And they go to a certain temperature. And if they're looking at the standard state, they measure at 298 Kelvin. And then the way they calculate their entropy is then they figure out the area under this curve. So notice it kind of looks like a triangle. And how they actually calculate the area under this curve, you don't have to worry about it. But mathematically, they do it using this equation. And you don't have to worry about that until you get into uh, the algebra where you start learning integrals. I forget where that is, but you'll find it eventually. The way you're going to be calculating entropy is the way, or by doing this. You're going to usually be calculating the change in entropy of your system. And so what you're going to do is you're going to take your final entropy and subtract your initial entropy. And the way we're actually going to do that is by adding up the energy or entropy of all of our products and subtracting the entropy of all of our reactants. Right? And your entropy increases if your products have a higher entropy than your reactors. So your entropy for a system can actually, uh, or your change in entropy for a system can actually end up being a negative value. So let's do a practice problem right here. So what we have here is acetylene reacting with oxygen to form CO2 and water. So this is the reaction that happens in an oxyacetylene torch that they used to cut metal with. Um, but let's calculate the change in entropy for this reaction. And we're gonna use this equation where we're gonna sum up the entropy of our products, subtract the entropy of our reactants. Of course, this N here refers to the number of moles uh, of a species. It'll be the number of moles times the entropy found in the table in appendix four of your book. I'll provide the values here today. And so what we have is the entropies of each species. We're going to start with our products and subtract the entropy of our reactants. So we're going to start with CO2. We have eight moles of CO2. We're going to multiply that by 213.8 joules per mole Kelvin. And that is going to give us the chain or the total entropy for the co2 we're going to add that to the total entropy of water which is going to be six times 69.9 then we're going to subtract the entropy of our reactants 
So it'll be four times 200.8, which will be the entropy of our acetylene, plus 11 times 205.0 for our entropy of our oxygen. So we'll plug that all into our calculator and find that we get a total entropy of negative 928.4 joules per mole Kelvin. I'll let you practice that uh, right here on this slide. Given the following standard molar entropy values at 298 Kelvin, what is the value of the change in entropy for our reaction for the dissolution of ammonium nitrate? If you want to pause right here, you are free to. All right, let's work through this problem. We've just got products and reactants over here. And the, the thing that makes this problem a little easier for us is the coefficient in front of each of these species is one. But this right here is the reaction that actually makes your cold compact get cold. Uh, so you have ammonium nitrate in a pack. You break the pack open. And that starts dissolving in a liquid. And as that dissolves, you get ammonium ions and nitrate ions. So let's take this stuff here on the right. We have 113.4 plus 146.4. We're just going to subtract 151.1 from that. Again, since the coefficients here are all one, we don't have to multiply anything. And that all works out to a value of 108.7 joules per mole of Kelvin. All right. Now that you've mastered entropy, let's introduce you to the philosophical ramifications of entropy. So entropy is often thought of in terms of chaos or disorder, um, but really it's the spreading out of energy. And the implication is that if the change in entropy of the universe is always greater than zero, then eventually, the entire universe will be entire, or all the energy and matter in the universe will be entirely spread out. And this is what uh, has been referred to as the heat death of the universe. Um, it's also sometimes called the cold death because the energy will actually be spread out so much that the final temperature will be really low, pretty close to freezing actually. But uh, if every spontaneous process that occurs since the universe began increased the entropy of the universe, then the way it's all going to end is, as T.S. Eliot put it, this is the way the world ends, not with a bang, but a whimper. And everything's just going to cool off, spread out. But of course, we're a long ways away from that. And who knows? It seems like the resurrection kind of reverses entropy, so we'll see if God uses slightly different math than uh, Boltzmann. Right, let's finish up with a couple ice eye clicker quizzes to see if you can apply this concept to uh, some real world problems. For each of the following processes, does delta S of the universe increase, but delta S uh, for the system decrease? Uh, let me read that again because I think I misread it. For which of the following processes does the change in en or entropy of the universe increase, but the change in entropy of the system decrease? If you'd like to pause the video now and work through this, you can. All right, so perspiration evaporates. You've got sweat on your head. It goes from a liquid to a gas. And the delta S of your system is definitely increasing as the molecules of sweat it consists of water and salt and some other organic stuff. It goes to be a gas. We have more room to bounce around. And the delta S of the universe also increases because it always increases. Dew forms overnight on blades of grass. So this is gaseous water turning into liquid water. That is a decrease in entropy. So in this case, you have a decrease in entropy and the, dec or the entropy of the universe is still actually increasing, but that's a little more complicated of a problem. It's as a result of energy moving from one place, uh, usually on the Earth, to radiating into outer space and changing the entropy of other systems. Uh, lastly, 
or no, but a cup of sugar dissolves in a pitcher of lemonade. You have a solid going to an aqueous state, and it's an increase in entropy. A log of wood burns in a fireplace, and taking complex uh, hydrocarbons and complex organic molecules, turning them into CO2, water, and other less complex uh, molecules. You're also turning a lot of it into a gas phase thing from a solid. So that's definitely increasing entropy. None, they are all spontaneous. Well, that doesn't matter so much, but dew forming overnight on a blade of grass is the answer there. A follow-up question on that. Consider, considering water to form dew on grass involves a decrease in entropy of the system, which is true. The entropy of the water uh, does uh, decrease as it condenses onto the grass. If delta S of the system for one drop of dew is negative one uh, joule per Kelvin, that means for every drop of dew, your ch entropy changes by negative one joule per Kelvin. What can we say about the delta S surrounding around one blade of grass with 12 drops of dew? So if we have 12 drops, each one, uh, we lose one joule per Kelvin of entropy, and we're gonna lose a total of 12 joules per Kelvin. And that's gonna be a value of negative 12 for our system, but our delta S of our universe has to be greater than zero. And so our delta S of our surroundings has to be greater than 12 joules per Kelvin. If you have any questions about that, let me know. But that ends the lecture for today. Hopefully you followed all of that, and I will see you next time.